Come on, Bill. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. I'm not going to climb the stairs. I'm going to introduce you down here, but we want you to go up there. This is a good man, and he does a good thing for our country. Going around, he was just in Missouri last week talking to the state folks there, and boy, they need it. Amen. Say. But he goes around this country trying to, to help all of us, but even help politicians know where they came from. Amen. Say about our country. Praise the Lord. Yeah. We welcome you today. Go get them. Uh, well, I want... You got that? Good. If my, if my mic doesn't go off, I mean my battery, I want you to know how much we love your pastor, Gary Clark, and the tremendous work that he's doing for the Lord right here at Fellowship. And join me in thanking the Lord for your pastor. Right. Go get him. Get up there. Well, it's an honor to be with you, and how many of you were in the first service? There were some that stayed over? Well, I talked to the first service about George Washington and how he trusted in the Lord in the different battles and so forth, and in this service, I'm going to talk and wind up with Abraham Lincoln, and I'm going to cover some stuff first. When you're a historian, you read history, but I also want to weave the gospel into this, so you'll uh, find a, um, a double message there. I do send out a daily email called American Minute, something that happened on each date in history. And the uh, w part that I want to start off with is the British Empire. And uh, I put together a book, in a, a, a book in a DVD called um, Who is the King in America? And I point out how the most common form of government in all the world's history is what? Monarchy, kings. And so in the book, I actually researched it. So. You go back to the beginning of the invention of writing, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, that's uh, called um, Iraq today. And the uh, writing was invented. You take a stick, poke it in clay. That was the beginning of writing. And from the beginning of writing, around 3300 BC, to today, around 2080, that's around five or 6,000 years of records, which is not that long. I mean, 6,000 years is only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. How many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years or close to it? Right? 60 people living 100 years back to back and you're back to the beginning of recorded human history. It's not that long ago. And so now that we have records, what do they show? They show the most common form of government is a king. Nimrod, Tower of Babel, uh, Egyptian pharaohs, Cyrus of Persia, Alexander the Great, Julius, and as the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger, right? Uh, Augustus Caesar, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, they keep getting bigger. Why? Because with military advancements, you can kill more people. Iron stronger than bronze and gunpowder and phalanxes and composite bows and so forth. But it's that same fallen nature of Cain killing Abel. But instead of using a stone, you use a rifle, right? But it's that same. And so what happens is, as the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger. Ultimately, there's a global goal in mind. And that's left for the book of Revelation, right? The Antichrist and all that. But we can see where the trend is. And so uh, the first nation that ruled itself without a king in these 6,000 years of records is who? Around 1400 BC, this nation came out of Egypt. And for 400 years, they did not have a king. Israel! Right? It's the book of Judges in the Bible. It's sort of this confusing chapter where they're you know, raising up leaders and so forth and backsliding and then they get oppressed. And they re That's the first instance in recorded history of a nation with millions of people and no king. And you thought the book of Judges was just this confusing. No, it's really an anomaly. And so um, in Israel, America's founders, especially the New England pastors, looked back to ancient Israel. And so Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts were founded by pastors and their churches, right? And so you had uh, the Puritans were, you know, pilgrims were persecuted in Europe. They came to, you know, settle these colonies. And uh, one of the interesting things was um, when they translated the Bible, um, Muslims were invading uh, Greece. The Greek scholars fled to Italy. Uh, they, they saw words in Greek that they had seen before. One was ecclesia. Now, it's translated church, but the reformers were translating ecclesia as congregation or assembly. Why? Because that's what the ancient Israelites had, a congregation or assembly. 
And the idea was that it's the people who are the church. Instead, not, not a, a hierarchical system, right? But it's the people that are the body of the church. And so this is what the New England pastors taught their congregations. And they looked back to ancient Israel as the model without a king for 400 years. And so Israel was the first nation with private land ownership. Because wherever there is a king, you never really own the land. It's always conditional, you staying on the nice side of the king. Um, Israel was the first nation where men were armed. Every man had a sword upon their thigh, and they were ready at a moment's notice to defend their family and their community. Israel was the first nation that could read. Only 1% of Egypt could read. Reading and writing was the, the uh, secret knowledge of the, the scribes. Uh, it was the deep state, right? Reading and writing was the deep state communication. In, in ancient Israel, everyone could read. It was a citizen-dependent model. And so if you think of it as a, a, a line, total government on one side, no government on the other. Total government, you have a king, no government is anarchy, unless each person is taught the law. And uh, it's like everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. Instead of a GPS telling you where to turn, tells you how to act, then the Levites are the computer geeks that help you to download the app, <laughs> the law. But you have it in your heart. But why would you follow it? Israel had the key ingredient. There is a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair. He's going to hold you accountable in the future. So you're about to steal. There's no king and army around. But you hesitate stealing. Why? Because you remember there's a God watching you. He wants you to be fair. He's going to hold you accountable. And so when we say it's one nation under God, it's more than nice, uh, just a nice acknowledgement. That's the motivating power that makes the whole thing work. Amen. If you get rid of God, all you got is a bunch of rules. Yes. Anyway, so I'll, I'll get, jump in. So we break away from the king of England. We take the power of a king. We separate it into three branches, separate it federal to state level, and we tie up this federal Frankenstein with ten handcuffs of the first ten amendments. All the Constitution is is a bunch of hurdles to prevent the rubber band from snapping back into the hands of a king. Right? You want to take that power of a king and separate it, right? Because when it gets back all together again, you're going to have this king dominating everybody. And um, so who's the king in America? Our founders set it up. The magistrate is not the king. The people are the king. You're the king. And Lincoln said, the people of these United States are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts. So you're the master of the Supreme Court, right? Um, and um, uh, Andrew Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida is named after him. He says, the people are the government, the sovereign power. And so kings have subjects who are subjected to their will. You do what the king says or he kills you. America, we have citizens. The word citizen is Greek and it means co-ruler, co-king. We're all co-kings of America, right? Now, uh, in a democracy, d the word democracy has two meanings. One is this general concept of the people participating in government. The other is the actual functioning form of government. And a pure democracy only ever worked on a small level like a city-state in Athens, where every citizen had to be there every day. It's 6,000 citizens, and everybody every day had to go to the market and talk politics in Athens. If you didn't show up for a couple days, you were called an idiotus, <laughs> an idiot. A republic is where you take care of your family and your farm, and you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day and talks politics. They are your representative. You're still the king, but you're ruling through these representatives. And so we pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. We're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. That's what it is when we pledge allegiance to the flag. We're pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. That we, the people, are the king. And we rule through these people we hire called representatives. And um, anyway, so when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I protest this system where the people rule the right? Well, why would you protest that? The only alternative is to have a king again, right? Some government dictating it. And so, um, so I think we should pledge allegiance to the flag. And, at football games. Anyway. <laughs> John Jay was the first Chief Justice. He says, Americans are the first people whom heaven has favored with an opportunity of choosing the forms of government under which they should live. Uh, he goes on, all other constitutions have derived their existence from violence or accidental circumstances. Your lives, your liberty, your property will be at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. If I were to sum up the greatness of America, you know, make America great again, it's this line right here. Your lives, your liberty, and your property are at the disposal of your creator and yourself. There's no king telling you what you can and cannot do, where you have to go to church, who you have to marry, what neighborhood you have to live in, what food you have to eat, what clothes you have to wear. No, you get to decide that. And so in a sense, you get to be the king of your life. 
And then together we're all co-kings of America. It's the total opposite of that pyramid structure with the king on top dictating top down. It's we the people, we're dictating bottom up. And so, uh, in America, our founders, for all their human failings, they gave us a form of government where we get to be the king of our life. And you get to put in the hard work and decide what career you want, path you want to take, and so forth, but you're in charge. And, um, and together we're all co-kings of America, and you have the opportunity of willingly submitting yourself to Jesus, the King of Kings. You know, it says uh, in Revelation, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father, to him be the glory forever and ever. He's made us kings, right? So we're kings. Um, so we're all kings, and we get to willingly submit ourselves to the King of Kings. Now why is that important? Because the founders didn't like the idea of being forced to worship God. Um, you know, you got to bow to my statue when I blow my trumpet, so otherwise I'll throw you in the fiery furnace. I don't care if you have a warm feeling in your heart for my statue. <laughs> you have to bow. Kings want to tell you what to believe. And the God of the Bible doesn't want to force you. He want, it says in um, the Psalms, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. So it's going to be us willingly submitting to ourselves to him. We take our thrones off and we cast them at his feet, right? Now Reagan said it this way, in this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in the world's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. You go through all this problem to get rid of a bad king, and you got a new guy that gets in power that doesn't want to be thrown out of power, and so what does he do? He puts all of his friends in places, and before you know it, you're back to another king. And then he ends up oppressing people, and I wrote on the whole history of Mexico, and it's like, you know, you know, one, Santa Ana, Benito Juarez, Porfirio Diaz, and Madero. I mean, they're all assassinating one another and killing one another. And um, Reagan said, here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, the Founding Fathers established the idea that you and I have within ourselves the God-given right and inability to determine our own destiny. So I was in Europe, I went to Beethoven's house. Did you know Beethoven was giving piano lessons to a, the daughter of a Czech duke? And they fell in love. But she was not allowed to marry him because he was in a lower class. He's a piano teacher and you're the daughter of a duke? Here, they couldn't even decide who they're gonna marry. I was in Dusseldorf, went through the museum and they had all these you know, mannequins with fancy dresses, all the old clothes that they used to wear. And then it had these drab brown and grays and it says that the king decided what colors the people could wear and the poor people could only wear brown and gray they're like burkas or something and um, and then if you're a, a Christian in Cairo Egypt um, you're called garbage people because you can never hold a job higher than a Muslim so you spend your day digging through garbage and um, and then if you're a Christian in um, you know North Korea and you're caught you're put in a labor camp and and then if you were born in India in that lowest caste the law is called the untouchables. You have to clean the sewers. And no matter how good a job you do, you can never graduate and become a Brahmin. The system limits you in Egypt and in North Korea and in India. In America, you're not limited by the system. You have the God-given right and ability to determine your own destiny. What clothes you want to wear, who you want to marry, and so forth. So, with that, um, I, I wanted to point out how unique America is. And... Lincoln wanted to stand up for that, and then Darwin. Did you know Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln were born on the exact same day? All right, February 12, 1809. Both of them, exact same day. And, uh, but they had, their lives had totally different uh, outcomes. Lincoln is best known for what? The Gettysburg Address, where he says, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Did you know that Darwin's theory is that all men are not created? They evolved. And they're not created equal because some are more evolved than others. And so Karl Marx, the communism, says that Darwin's book is very important and serves me as the basis in natural selection for the class struggle in history. So here Darwin influenced Karl Marx. Dar Karl Marx actually dedicated a personal copy of his communist book, Das Kapital, to Charles Darwin. 
inscribing it that he was a sincere admirer of Darwin. And so Stalin, uh, Stalin is responsible for an estimated 60 million deaths. Why? Because if you know God and you're in charge, if people serve your, your agenda, they can live. If they challenge you, then you want to get rid of them. So Stalin had a no notorious 1937 order number 00447, which called for mass ex execution and exile of socially harmful elements and enemies of the people. And the deaths during Stalinist period are estimated up to 61 million people. So you have a king, or, a, or a, nowadays they don't call them kings, but a chairman Mao, or a um, you know, prime minister, or a El Prime, or whatever the name is, it's this function where one person gets to be in charge. And so every communist country has a dictator. Uh, you know, students say, well, I thought socialism and communism was everybody owns everything equally. Let's think a little deeper. Who decides who lives in the nice house and who lives in the dumpy house? Oh, some money in the government dictates those things. Well, whoever ultimately dictates those things is the dictator. So every socialist communist country is a dictator. And they want to stay in power. And so uh, Margaret Sanger in, wrote in her autobiography, as she addressed a Ku Klux Klan rally and so forth, um, she wrote, she was influenced by Darwin. And she wrote Pivot Civilization, she says, elimination of human weeds overrunning the human garden from the cessation of charity. Why? Because it prolongs the lives of the unfit. And um, she calls for um, uh, getting rid of the maladjusted sterilization of genetically inferior races. Question, who gets to decide which race is genetically inferior? <laughs> Somebody in the government. And um, so her magazine, the Birth Control Review, published articles by Nazi party member Ernst Rudin called the father of racial hygiene. Now what's that? I know what hygiene is, that's like washing your hands. This is racial hygiene. They want to wash the gene pool and get rid of genetically inferior people groups. And um, anyway, uh, Ernst Rudin called them untermensch, under mankind, right? And uh, in his estimation it was Jews and he sent millions, they ended up sending millions of them to the gas chambers. Now Harry S. Truman, in his State of the Union said, we believe in the dignity of man. We believe that he was created in the image of the Father of us all. Another place Truman said, we believe that all men are created equal because equal they're created in the image of God. From this faith we will not be moved. Do you know Islam says Allah doesn't have an image, so you can't be made in his image. Buddhism and Hinduism, there's hundreds and millions of gods. In, in Hinduism, every family has their own god, right? And so which one are you made in the image of? Uh, atheism, there is no God. The very concept that we're made in the image of God is a Bible concept. It comes from the Bible. And um, now, Lincoln. I, my, I might want to borrow your mic because I feel the... You feel that thing. It just echoes in and out. Did you know what Lincoln's last piece of legislation that he signed before he was shot? was to put the phrase, in God we trust, on our coins. And I actually have one of these. It was a 1864 two-cent piece. And, uh, but here, he put in God we trust on our national coins. We have it on there today. Uh, it was Eisenhower that put in God we trust on our paper currency. And the, uh, this is still trivia. The first paper currency that came off the press within God we trust on it came off the press on October 1st, 1957. Why do I think that's sort of neat? Because that's my birthday. Anyway. But here's Lincoln putting God. Now, Stalin said, uh, the, his, the book on Stalin says, Landmarks in Life of Stalin. It says, at a very early age, while a, still a pupil in the ecclesiastical school, Comrade Stalin developed a critical mind and revolutionary sentiments. He began to read Darwin and became an atheist. So Darwin's theory creates atheists. It undermines the concept of God. Lincoln, during the Civil War, uh, proclaimed a day of fasting. He says, we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too proud to pray to the God that made us. He goes on, it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Yes. Now, 
One of the books that I put together, it's uh, called Miracles in American History, but I highlight these days of fasting and prayer that the presidents called and what happened afterwards. And over and over again, they always talk about confessing our national sins. And it's like, why is that important? Why can't we just say God bless us? Uh, they had an understanding. And uh, now, Lincoln, his day of fasting was to be observed and was observed on April 30th, 1863. National Day of Fasting. Question, what happened two days later? The South shoots one of its own best generals, Stonewall Jackson, right? He's after the Battle of Chancellorville. He's outnumbered like two to three to one, and he's winning. And the evening of the first day of the battle, he's surveying the battlefield. He comes back at twilight, and his own men yell, stop, who goes there? And before he can answer, they let a volley of shots off. They shoot him twice in the arm, once in the hand, kill his horse, kill about 15 people. And then in the, in the dark twilight, they put him on a stretcher, and they stumble and fall and mangles his arm and has to get amputated. And he dies. And just about every Civil War historian will admit that he was such a great general that if he had been at the Battle of Gettysburg two months later, the South probably would have won. Now, it's hard to reconcile because he was a godly man. He taught Sunday school classes, and he was even breaking the law because in his state, they had a law making it a crime to teach slaves to read. And he was teaching them to read so they could read the Bible. And he was a godly man, but yet God had a bigger plan for the country, and the bigger plan was to get rid of slavery. And, uh, but it was just so it happened, it was two days after this National Day of Fasting and Prayer. Now, Lincoln, in his inaugural address, how many of you have been to Washington, D.C., the Lincoln Memorial? And uh, he's sitting in the chair, and if you look over to the right of his chair, the whole wall is his second inaugural address. Both sides read the same Bible, pray to the same God, the prayers of both could not be answered, and so forth. Uh, but in there he says this, if we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which God, in the, which in the providence of God, he now wills to remove, and that he gives this terrible war as the woe due to those whom the offense came. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword, as it was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said today, the judgments of the Lord are altogether true and righteous altogether. Lincoln had the audacity to connect national sin with national judgment. Hmm. You think anybody has the audacity to make that connection today? Well, um, you know, a way of explaining how when we say God bless us and why they put in there confess our sins. Have you ever played with magnets? And if you stick them together, right, they stick. But if you turn one of them, then what? They repel. And so if you think of it this way, you got two magnets. One is God and the other is you. And uh, the God magnet has two sides to it. One side says, I want to bless you. And the other side says, judgment, right? Blessings, cursings, right? And the you magnet has two sides to it. One side says, repent and believe. And the other side says, doubt and sin. So if you have your repent and believe side facing God's I want to bless you side, the magnets stick together. And so all through the Bible, it says, repent and believe, right? And, uh, and so it, it sticks. And there's the blessing of salvation, the blessing of God here in our prayers. But if we flip and we have doubt and sin, the magnets just won't touch. Remember, Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth, and he could do few miracles there because of their unbelief. He was ready to do them, but they're, 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 he couldn't make the, the electrical connection. He was, you know... And God cannot bless sin. Remember the children of Israel coming into the promised land. And King Balak gets the prophet Balaam to stand on a hill and says, curse him. Well, he gets up there and opens his mouth and out comes a blessing. The king says, let's try this again. He has another altar, kills some animals, now curse him. He opens his mouth and out comes a blessing. Happens a third time. And this King Balak is like pulling out his hair. And Balaam says, you cannot curse what God has blessed. Like, oh, I like that, I like that. But then a couple chapters later, you see King Balak and the Moabites 
sending young Moabite women into the Israeli camp to lure the young men to their sexually immoral stuff they were doing. And then the Israelites got defeated in battle. And um, God was furious at Balaam for letting them in on this secret. That if they sin, God cannot come to their rescue. God cannot bless them. And then when Israel repented, and there's this young, you know, guy, uh, you know, Phineas or whatever, and he like throws a spear through the one guy, and it goes through the, the prostitute or whatever. And, and, it, and uh, anyway, they repent. And Moses and all the elders are on their face before the temple, and they repent. And then they win, and they, they defeat the Moabites or whoever they were. And then it lists all the people that were killed. King Balaam got killed, and Balaam got killed. But this is so important because even in the book of Revelation, twice it says to this one church, repent, uh, you know, because you're following the sins of Balaam. And so, in other words, we have to repent before we can ask. And that's even in the Our Father. Our Father, for art in heaven, hallowed be the name of the kingdom of God. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So if you're refusing to forgive those who trespass against you, God can't forgive you. It's, it's like you're, and so when you say, okay, I forgive him, the magnet flips around in your heart. The other person doesn't even know you have a problem with them. It's your heart and God's heart and the polarity of your, of your magnet. And when you forgive them, then it flips around and it makes that connection. So um, now if, if we insist on doubt and sin, then God's magnet flips around to judgment. Sin attracts God's judgment because he's a just God. He can't help it. Uh, now, it, it, Ronald Reagan put it this way. Uh, the great champion of the sanctity of all human life in that day, Abraham Lincoln, gave us his assessment of the Declaration's purpose. We will never recognize the true value of our own lives until we affirm the value of the lives of others. However, lo, and it flickers or fiercely it burns. It is still a divine flame which no man dare presume to put out, be his motives ever so humane or unenlightened. Lincoln recognized that we could not survive as a free land when some men could decide that others were not fit to be free and should be, therefore be slaves. Likewise, we cannot survive as a free nation when some men decide that others are not fit to live and should be abandoned to abortion or infanticide. This is Ronald Reagan saying this. He's connecting the sin of the country with the judgment. And what's our response? We repent. Now, repentance is personal, it's individual. Um, I, uh, God is a jealous God, so we want a personal relationship with each person. I don't know how he does it, but he's God. And he, he's a jealous God, and he wants a personal relationship with each person. And um, I, um, I'm going to just skip past a couple of quotes there. But um, God is a God of love. What's the most important thing in your life? It's, it's being loved and loving. You don't have somebody dying on the deathbed, and, and the family comes in to the room there, and uh, his last words were, uh, you can save on your car insurance. <laughs> no, it's I love you, and we love you, right? That's the most important thing in our lives. Now, if we're made in God's image, what's the most important thing to him, right? It's loving and being loved. Now, think of God. Here he is. God exists for eternity, and he makes everything. If anything were to show him affection, it's because he made it and programmed it to show him affection. It's, and so it's really not a love. It's just doing what he programmed it to do. So it's almost like, okay, I, I can make things that obey me. I, I want somebody that can love me. And so he made us in his image with the ability to love him, the capacity to love him. So now the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. Think of that. The creator of the universe is jealous over the thoughts in your brain. Now, God does not need your love any more than parents don't need the love of their kids. But they want it. Right? They want the affection, the fellowship, and the time together. They don't need it, but they want it. God doesn't need our love, but he wants it, and he wants it really bad. Now, it says in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that Israel and the church is the bride of Christ. 
You know, and Hosea says, oh, Israel, I betrothed you under myself, and you bled the harlot, right? But, but we're the bride of Christ. Now, most grooms are jealous if their bride's thinking more about another guy. God is jealous when we're thinking about something else more than him. So it says in, in Exodus, it says, I am Lord, my name is jealous. So yes, we say it sort of flippantly, God loves you. Yeah, he loves you with a jealous love. He jealously wants your love back. But the thing about love, by definition, love has to be voluntary. It cannot be forced. The very moment it's forced, it evaporates. And so here's God. He makes everything, everything obeys him, but he wants to be loved, so he has to make creatures that can love him, but he can't force them, because the moment he would force them, it wouldn't be love anymore. It'd just be like everything else he did that just obeys him, but he wants somebody to love him. Sort of like if a husband twists his wife's arm and says, tell me you love me. No matter what she says, she doesn't love him. But if he woos her and courts her and defends her and protects her and rescues her and provides for her and takes her to dinner and gives her flour and chocolates, and out of the abundance of her heart, it bubbles up, I love you. Then it means something. That's what God's after. He's not after, obey me or I chop your head off. <laughs> if he wanted us to obey him, he could have made us to obey him. He, say, he, he can make things that obey him for real good. He wants something that can love him. And the love has to be voluntary, because if he forced it, it would evaporate. So here we are. Here we are, people that he made. He wants us to love him really bad, but he can't force it. And those of you that were in the first service, forgive me if I share, but it's, it's such a, to me, it's a real thing, is, is the plan of how we come to the Lord. So he wants us to come to him. He, he wants us to embrace him. And it has to be voluntary. And, uh, but our sins keep us away. Um, have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of want to avoid the person you've sinned against. You want to sort of stay away from them, right? So we go to the Bible, Adam and Eve sinned against God and they hid. So God still wanted to be around them, but when they hid, they wanted to get away from him. And so when you sin against somebody, like say so you're talking about somebody behind their back, you're making fun of them, joking about them, and you look up and there they are walking through the door in your direction. Question, are you drawn to want to go over to them? Or like, oh great, there they are, I was just talking about. I think I'm going to go out the back. Your own conscience does not want you to be around the person you sinned against. It's the magnets flipped the wrong way. God wants to be around you, but you want to sort of get away. So it's not so much that God sends people to hell. It's once people sin against God, their own conscience won't let them come into his presence. They want to avoid him like the magnets try to push him, and they're just not going to. So Adam and Eve sinned, and they said, man, we, did, we blew it. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God again. They put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions. Man coming up with man's idea how to make man acceptable to God. And did Adam and Eve's fig leaves make him acceptable to God? No. And this little line, God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. We read it really fast, but if you think of it, how do you make a coat of skin? Kill an animal. So do you think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? Or maybe did he kill it right in front of them? And they watched the first death ever, right? So creation just happened a chapter before or so. This is the first thing ever to die, and Adam and Eve are watching this innocent animal go through these pangs of dying, and they're just shocked, and they're thinking to themselves, we're the ones that sin, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear to them that this animal was dying in their place, that right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal and he puts it on their naked bodies. Maybe it still had some blood on it, right? They were covered in the blood. So for the rest of their lives, Adam and Eve are wearing the skin of that animal that they watched die in their place. And whenever God looks at Adam and Eve, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Right? We have the picture in the Bible of um, Jacob going before his blind dad, Isaac, and uh, wanting to get a blessing. And the mom, Rebecca, said, tell you what, let's take a goat and let's, or, you know, a lamb, and let's put the skin on you and put your brother's clothes. And so, so um, Jacob went before Isaac with, with his brother's righteousness, <laughs> right? And so, uh, uh, so we come before the Lord, like Adam and Eve, wearing the righteousness of Jesus. Anyway. 
Adam and Eve are covered with the skin. Adam and Eve tell Cain and Abel, this is how you worship God. Cain decides he wants to worship God, but he's going to try to do the, the fig leaf thing. He starts the church of the fruits and the nuts. So Cain's religion is a religion of works. And we know it's works because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake, and you'll bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. So here's Cain. He's sweating. It's, how long does it take to grow stuff? I mean, he's like plowing and growing it and he harvests it all. He piles all of his hard, hard work on the altar. Did his works make him acceptable to God? No. Same as the fig leaves. No. And Abel trusted in the lamb. And so he kills the lamb and God accepts it. And so it is this beautiful picture that God is on one side, we're on the other side. Our sins are in between, keeping us away from God, and the lamb pays for the sin. And so Abraham offered lambs. Noah offered lambs when he got off the ark. Uh, Moses had every family in Israel kill a lamb, put the blood over the doorpost of its house so the angel of death would pass over. And then the high priest brings the blood of the lamb into the holy of holies and sprinkles it on the mercy seat. You know, the ark of the covenant with the angels and, and the blood actually changes it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. If you were to approach God without the blood, you're asking for judgment because he's a just God. And... Um, so finally, John the Baptist points at Jesus, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So Jesus is the Lamb. We're on one side. God's on the other side. Our sins separate us from God, and the Lamb pays for the sin. So I ask people, are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you are still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you are approaching God as Cain. I hope I did enough good works. I hope I piled enough barley on the altar. Maybe, maybe a couple, couple handfuls of oats. That would put me over the top. Or are you approaching God as Abel? It's not me. It's this lamb that paid for all my sins, and I'm trusting in that. And then the thought is, why did the lamb have to die? All right, Jesus, out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, became the lamb. And... Um, He's sweating drops of blood. Why? You know, I was reading the book of Revelation, and again, those that heard me say this, bear with me. Um, but it's, it's God that's pouring out the judgment in the book of Revelation. And the lamb comes and breaks the seal, and the censure's thrown to the earth, and the fire comes, right? And, um, and then the angels cry out, Righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. And then it says, The smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. And why is that? Once and for all, for the, to settle it for the rest of eternity, God judges all the sins. So from that point on, there's no more judgment. And so he's settling the score with the book of Revelation. So for the rest of eternity, the judgment's over. And, um, and in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. Jesus took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. You know, it says in the Bible, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Jesus experienced that judgment as if it was a thousand years. And if you think of it as a scale, an eternal being who is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all the finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. I'll say it again. An eternal being who is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all the finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in each of our places. He paid the penalty for our sins. That's why we approached the Father, not through our fig leaves and through our barley, but through the blood of the Lamb. That's why out of all of human history, there's only one person that is eternal and innocent that suffered. None of the other religions have that. Every other religion is still a religion of works. There's still religions of Cain. There's still fig leaves. There's still, I got to do something. I got to do something. I got to do something. No, it's already been done for you. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. So here we are. Approaching God. That's why we sing the songs to Jesus. He took that. He bore that on himself on the cross. And then he rose from the dead to prove that he was who he said he was. If he would have done it 
and not risen from the dead to tell us, we wouldn't know. But, it's all, but he rose from the dead, and he told us, and then his disciples, go out and tell everybody it's, it's paid for. That's the good news. The word gospel means good news. How good would it be to come up to somebody and say, you know, here's a new set of rules, and if you keep them really, really close, you just might barely make it. That's not good news. No, good news is all your sins have been paid for. Now, if you think of it, if you're here and God's here and you don't have any body, it's just your spirits, right? As long as you think that your relationship with God is based on you doing something, you will always have this nagging thought in the back of your head, did I do enough? And that very thought is going to cause you to hesitate coming to him. The magnet, the polarity is the wrong way. It's going to... But as soon as you believe, really truly believe that it's all been paid for, you mean he's not upset about it? No, it's all been paid for. You mean I don't owe him anything? No, it's all been paid for. You mean every, yes, everything, it's all been paid for. Then you're like, well, what's keeping me back? And the moment you believe that, you can come and embrace the Lord. And like a piece of metal sticking up against a magnet, the metal gets magnetized. His spirit comes in us. And now that same magnetism, that love, is reaching out through us to the rest of the world. And we're pulling people to Jesus. Hey, God loves you. He loves you. He's paid for your sins. Come to him. So America's founders decided, no, we don't want to set up a system where you have to believe the way the king tells you to believe or he's going to chop your head off or burn you to the stake. No, we want to set up a system where people have the freedom of conscience. They can freely give their lives to the Lord. They can freely take off their crown and throw it at his feet. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Pastor. Good job. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, man. Fellowship meets every Sunday morning on our beautiful 15 and a half acre campus in the Bullseye of Rotunda, West Florida at 140 Rotunda Boulevard West. Early worship begins at 8.30 a.m. with our morning worship service beginning at 10.30 a.m. Between these two services, we offer gourmet coffee, fresh juices, pastries, and lots of fellowship free of charge in our hospitality center. If you are looking for a church in the Inglewood area or would just like to pay us a visit, we would love to fellowship with you. For more information, give us a call at 941-475-7447 or log on to fcinglewood.com. For Pastor Gary Clark and all of us at Fellowship, God bless you.